All right, thank you for staying. Time for us to take a look at the daybreak, uh, the dailies on daybreak uh, this morning. We have in the studio Dr. Theophilus Abba, the director of Daily Trust Foundation, with us in the studio uh, to give perspectives on some of the stories on the front page. Thank you for joining us on daybreak. Uh, thank you and good morning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's begin with Daily Trust newspaper. Uh, it has just about uh, one story, the lead story. Uh, there it says, as Buhari kicks off oil drilling in the north, Bauchi, Gombe residents demand jobs, clean environment. The writer says, we don't want a repeat of Niger Delta crisis. Uh, fast track infrastructure to make drilling a reality. Uh, it shall be well with full PIA implementation, according to experts. And you will find that on page four of the Daily Trust newspaper. All right, now let's take a look at the Punch newspaper. The Punch has a lead story that says, National Carrier, FG Domestic Airlines legal battle kicks off Thursday. The first rider, 10 lawyers to lead local airlines legal team. Sans professors drafted. We also have another rider, Aviation Ministry director leads government's lawyers, plans to vacate injunction. And beneath that, we have Ogun PDP, Supreme Court orders retrial, party crisis worsens. Kidnappers abduct ex Akeridolu's aid, demand 100 million ransom. Still on the Punch newspaper, politicians will use dump you, IG warns policemen. Also, presidency not can dictate to others, says Adebanjo. Impeachment, new AKT speaker, successor differ. Who lumps invade Atiku rally, supporters injured. Still, we have on the, on the Punch newspaper, petrol electricity subsidies hurting poor Nigerians. This is coming from the World Bank. These are the major stories on the Punch newspaper for today. All right, looking at the Nation newspaper, you would find a lead story there saying uh, why Atiku PDP will lose in 2023 by Kwankoso. Uh, it has a writer that says, nobody can win presidential poll without Lagos, Kano, Rivers vote. No indication we will lose PDP, tells NMPP uh, candidate. You would also find above the masthead, Equity Assembly gets new speaker. Uh, I remain in office. That's uh, on the writer there. A World Bank advises federal government on fiscal adjustments. Uh, Saka scores uh, uh, Braz in, uh, in England a win, uh, Senegal lose to Holland. Uh, these are the stories. And then you also have uh, how one million man PVC march for Tinubu shut down Kano. These are the stories on the Nation newspaper. Over now to this day newspaper, which has a late story that says, Obi to Nigerians, I'll be in charge of Nigeria. Hold me responsible. And the first writer says he won't give excuses as president, but provide solutions. Retrace commitment to transforming nation outlines agenda. Declares error of borrowing for consumption over. Also, we have from uh, Adebanjo, it's Igbo's right to produce next president. Says APC has disqualified Southeast. We also have another rider, Nigeria's unity negotiable, Baba Ahmed posits. And just above the masthead, cop lord MFLA on Naira redesign, alleges move by lawmakers to scuttle initiative. And just above that, World Bank president, this is coming from the World Bank president, Nigeria in urgent need to strengthen fiscal management. Hapson need to create unified, stable market-based exchange rate. That is about it on this day newspaper for today. All right, let's take a look at the Blueprint newspaper. The lead story there uh, talks about OB to NGE, Nigerians on 2023. Let's vote character, competence, capacity. Uh, says governance requires physical and mental energy. Atiku supporters disrupt G5 governors at Lagos meeting. I will end insurgency, Atiku assures. 
uh, you'll find that on page six and then uh, just below the mass head NILDS recommends uh, first degree as minimum qualification for lawmakers laments high turnover of legislators at electoral circles uh, you'd also find NIS arrest eight human trafficking victims in Jigawa, uh, fire raises two-story building in Inugu, uh, 700 million naira Diziani cash, EFCC rearranges uh, euro others. Uh, also, uh, Oshun 2022 tribunal admits subpoena to produce a delicate certificate. Now, the footnote: exchange rate will appreciate after ongoing naira redesign, says Apcon. Uh, as uh, RMRDC develops the fruit juice uh, subsector, UBA promises customers uh, Christmas to remember in Super uh, Savers Draw. Man uh, 45 arrested for beating wife uh, to death in Ogun. Uh, AKT Assembly impeaches Ribisoga uh, elects Adelupa, first female speaker. So these are the stories on the front page of the Blueprint newspaper. Uh, and that's about uh, all that we're going to be uh, looking at on the papers. Let's uh, take perspectives on some of the stories. Uh, we told you we have Dr. Theophilus Abba uh, in the studio. Thank you again for joining uh, us on the break. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, let me get your take on the lead story on the Daily Trust newspaper about the Bauchi uh, oil uh, drilling that is about to commence. Uh, we understand that the president uh, will be visiting uh, the site where he's going to uh, do the groundbreaking. What's your take on this? Well, um, I think that is a very positive development. And um, it is a result of um, resilience um, by the government and let me say by the NNPC. I must commend the NNPC for their resilience. You know, because uh, for some years now, um, there has been a um, hypothesis that there was oil in the Benue trough, you know, so from uh, Bauchi uh, to, uh, to the part, uh, part of the north, including uh, uh, Burunu, it's believed that, I mean, to have oil reserves in the whole of that area. Mm -hmm. And a lot of work has gone into uh, the research and the investigation and uh, to, to be sure that, I mean, the oil is in a commercial quantity. Now, what has happened now is uh, a vindication of, uh, you know, what government has labored over the years to prove, you know, that there's actually oil reserves uh, in the Benue trough. So it's a very positive uh, development. And um, the more uh, oil resources that you have, the tendency that you're going to get um, a lot of um, uh, foreign exchange, we have more uh, oil to supply to the international market and uh, we get more revenue to develop uh, the country. So in a nutshell, I would say that um, that's a very positive development because if you have oil in Chad, you have oil in Niger Republic, we have discovered that there's oil in, uh, in some of the countries in the, in the Sahel region, you know, oil has been discovered there. So it is believed that there's the oil in that part of uh, Nigeria. So it is good that the NNPC has uh, demonstrated that it can do it, and this breakthrough has happened. Mm. Except right. that it's coming at towards the, I mean, at at the tail end of uh, this administration. Uh, others are saying, well, is this all political? Like, I mean, this is a project that has been lying fallow uh, for. I think about two decades or more. It's about 30 uh, years. It you know, started about 30 exactly. years. Exactly, and uh, now that the the current administration is about to, you know, wind, wind up. I, I think exploration, I mean, it takes time. You know, we've got a whole lot of technical things you know, need to be put in place. And um, I still believe that government is a continuum. You know, whatever has been achieved now, you know, it's based on the I mean, groundwork that other previous administrations have, uh, have laid. But I want to say that it depends largely on the determination of a government to achieve a feat like this. You know, like you say, it has been there over the years, but this government has been determined, the NFC has been determined to look to say, look, we know there's the potential to access oil in this part of Nigeria. You know, we have to go I mean, the whole hog 
make all the efforts to achieve that objective, you know, and that is what has happened. So, if it was done under Buhari, of course, he's the petroleum minister, you know, and if it was done under him, I mean, he can take the glory for it. But like I said, this is not something that will say just political. If there's no oil, there's no oil. If there's oil, there's oil. Well, you know, this is just the beginning. This is just the kickoff of the oil drilling. There's also the need to uh, install pipes that will now push out the oil from there. Mm. And some persons are saying that it is hoped that it will not take another long time before that is done so that people can actually feel the impact of this oil that is there. Now, the, the issue is that with the, the, the nature of the NNPC, NNPC is now oriented towards making profit, you know. So NNPC uh, has to demonstrate to Nigerians that it can um, I mean, produce oil at the commercial, uh, vo in the commercial volume. NNPC will ensure that it does everything, you know, to, uh, to come up with, uh, to make profit, you know. So I think that whatever is needed to be done, you know, will be done. One, I know that with the discovery of oil and the, I mean, um, with what is being done in, uh, in Bauchi State, NNPC can access foreign loans, usually from World Bank or from IMF, to be able to get the material to pipe, you know, um, uh, to, to pipe oil from that part of uh, the world, to, uh, Nigeria, to any part of the world, whether it is to a refinery or for export. You know, there will be access to, to I mean, to, to, fund, to finance, to be able to execute the project. So I think the, one of the concerns that the people have raised, and that is what I think we can even dwell upon, is the impact of, I mean, this discovery on the environment. Mm. You know, I think the people are already saying, look, we don't want what happened in Niger Delta to happen to us. Mm -hmm. You know, environmental degradation and then, and all those things. But the PIA, you know, the PIA, if uh, implemented to the letter, will take care of some of these things mm -hmm. because and it, it, this is being done by NNPC. It's not even uh, a foreign oil company. It's NNPC that okay. is what you need. And we, it, I mean, we, I expect that, look, they, I will take all the precautions necessary to ensure that there's no repeat of uh, the damages done in the Niger Delta. Okay, there's also another concern that is being raised by certain people. They are saying that, it, they are expressing hope that the fact that we're finding this oil across parts of the country mm -hmm. does not uh, make the, the government to lose uh, focus because there's still the need to diversify the economy seeing that i mean other countries are moving away from oil so as much as we find this oil mm -hmm. in the future that may not be really the uh, what will be bringing in the money right well um, the issue about um, energy transition which is you know a popular um, step many countries are taking now in moving from uh, fossil fuel to clean energy is very is is, is quite interesting. But the, the, the fact is that um, it will take time. You know, it will, it will take quite some time before we can say the world is no longer going to use oil. You know, we have seen um, changes over the years. At a point, it was coal. And who would say, okay, we're not, going, we're not going to use coal. But then we're discovering that other countries are returning, returning to coal. So, as you mentioned, there is good, I mean, it's necessary for Nigeria to think of diversification. Mm -hmm. But you see, diversification is not achieved overnight. Okay. But because, will, uh, let me, I, I, I want I, to make this point. Mm -hmm. you know, because, you see, even other countries that have diversified, like Norway, Norway used to be dependent on oil, but they totally diversified. You know, it, but it was the oil resources that was used to, to build the other sectors. You know, the, the income from the oil was used to, I mean, to, to, uh, to, to develop other sectors of, uh, of the economy. So we still need the oil money to be able to develop agriculture, to be able to develop uh, the industries, to be able to the other sectors. So I'm thinking that the more oil you have is not, it's not going to do us uh, any damage. Okay. It's the you, utilization you, of this money that's that, that is the issue. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, you talk about the energy transition, which mm -hmm. is, you said, is going to take time. But mm -hmm. except that the effect, the climate change impact, is not taking time. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> we are already seeing the impact, especially for mm. us on this in this part of the world. We are already seeing negative impact of climate change. Mm. I mean, evident by the recent flood that we have seen in in some states across the country. About in fact, 28 states of out of the 36 states and on all that. So, and the ongoing conversations about the the needs to fast track 
you know, energy transition. The COP27, for instance, we've had, we've had talks there. Uh, African countries are talking about adaptation finance and the rest of them. So the impact seem to be, we, are, we, we seem to be feeling the full weight of it already. No, actually, it's true that we're feeling the weight of the um, uh, climate change, you know. But, I mean, this is my own uh, perspective. You see, who are the um, culprits? Who are the people uh, causing this? It's not Africa. Mostly the developed societies, I mean, the developed countries, they are the, they are the ones responsible. Now, I, I know that... I mean, um, there, there is this, um, I don't know whether it is, I don't, I don't know how the, the right concept now, this idea of reduce emission, reduce this, and then you get to some, some amount of money from the, from the developed society to develop to your country. But sincerely, the, the, I mean, the, the, uh, the qualification, I mean, the requirements, you know, is very, very high. You understand? So what I'm driving at is that, you see, we cannot say that because of energy transition, we should abandon our oil resources. That is some of what I'm, I'm, I'm mm. saying. Mm. You see, we still need these oil resources to run our system. We still need these oil resources to be able to develop, I mean, other, even, even, even the clean energy. You need oil resources to, uh, to acquire clean energy. For instance, you know, getting uh, solar energy is not, you don't use, uh, I mean, peanut to, to buy solar. The kind of solar that can produce, bring this kind of electricity that you use in this building, this complex. You know, we take millions, if not billions, of naira. Isn't you know? it why we are talking about you know, so the adaptation finance that uh, the developed countries are supposed to be giving out to developing countries like Nigeria? Yes, but the requirement, you know, to be able to access that money is not is not uh, easy, because if you have, if you if you follow the uh, the trend, you know, the issue of deforestation, you know, they will tell you they give you some money, you know, to be able to plant, I mean, uh, 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 trees, you know, that will. For, for you to plant trees that develop to a forest, take over a period of 10 years. Mm -hmm. So even this thing that you are talking about now, overcoming them over a short period is not, is not possible. Right. Okay. So let's, I'm thinking, let's, I'm let's, thinking right. that... Let's move away okay. uh, mm -hmm. so that we don't <laughs> yeah, deviate completely. Right. Uh, the, the editorial of the Daily Trust newspaper, okay. uh, it's uh, talking about justice for Margaret Joshua, uh, an 11-year-old maid uh, who was, uh, you know, uh, horribly, I would say, treated by uh, a mother of two who she works for. And there's all kinds of abuses that we have seen, domestic violence. In fact, one of the stories on the Daily Trust also talks about a man who killed, who beat his wife uh, to death. Mm. You know, and this is not the first of it. We've had several you know, of such stories. So talking about you know, domestic violence and how you know, all of that, I would like for you to comment on this particular case of uh, uh, Margaret. Okay, um, it's very, very unfortunate that um, the young girl, um, I mean, had to suffer what, uh, what she suffered. You know, but we have discovered that, you see, the uh, security agencies fail Nigerians. So also the judiciary. You know, the reason why these things persist is, quite, is because, you see, when um, a child is abused, and a report is lodged at the police station. The police will not carry out diligent investigation. Now, uh, if um, a woman is abused by her husband, you know, under what we call gender-based violence now, and you go to the police, you are told, oh, just go and say to yourself, it's your husband. You know, no punishment is made, no investigation is even carried out. And even the process of investigating, if any investigation is being carried out, the woman will be so, I mean, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be so frustrated by the way the police will handle the case to the point that it will say, why did I even go to the police? And then when the issue successfully gets to a court of law, you know, the way um, the judges will handle, I mean, the case or such cases will so discourage anybody who, who goes to the court to, to court to say, look, you, I, I brought my husband to court you know, and the police had written a report, an investigative report, that is wishy-washy, and then the judge keeps postponing even, uh, I mean, hearing the case. So the, the, those who go to court in order to seek the redress over this kind of violence, they get frustrated. 
And I'm thinking that if we have made a law, we call it child right, a child right, right law, then let us see security agencies, you know, ensuring that the letters of this law are adhered to. If a child is, I mean, uh, uh, is uh, brutalized, let's see punishment. Let's see proper investigation. Let the judges do their job. Let them, let them come out and, 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 and read, I mean, pronounce the kind of sentences that would deter others from engaging in it. But as long as corruption, you know, is, uh, uh, I mean, is uh, involved, as long as our policemen keep receiving bribes, you know, and, I mean, write the wrong investigative reports, as long as they, they I mean, they, they discourage people from even making use of the, the legal instruments available, these things will, con will continue. All right. Well, I, on the part of the parents, is there something they can do uh, at the point of giving out their children to work for certain people? Is there anything that can be done? Now, some of these um, problems arise from the fact that, you know, parents don't investigate, you know, uh, the people uh, to whom they give their children as uh, maybe houseboys or house chefs. You know, if somebody comes to you and says, look, I need your child, your daughter, your son to come and uh, work for me as a house chef. You say, okay, we need money in this house. You will pay 10,000 naira every month. Okay, you go and follow him or follow her. And then that is all. You don't know the person's temperament. You don't even sign any concrete agreement. You know, I think it is now time for government to take a closer look at this issue of uh, children who are being used as house helps or house boys, you know, in homes. Because there must be an intervention, let me say government intervention, a judicial intervention, to say, look, if you want to uh, take a child as house help or a girl as house, as house help, must meet certain conditions. You must, I mean, sign some agreement, you know. There has to be a kind of legal agreement that will, that will, bind, that will be binding on the two parties or the parents giving out their, their children and those who are um, taking, uh, taking these children. Mm -hmm. you know, unless there is that agreement, a legal instrument, you know, it will be really difficult for you to seek justice. In but, any case, at what age, as a matter of fact, uh, should we be talking about house help or being a maid? I mean, generally, at 11, it's child abuse. At, at, because at 11, clearly, it's, it's you know, it, it's below the, 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 it's, the, the age. It's a classical case of child abuse, you know. But, you know, the way our society is, you know, we have just accepted some of these things as a norm, you know, as a way of life. Oh, um, this child, I mean, I need, I need a, a young uh, girl, I need a young boy who will clean my house, who will take care of my children, who will do my cooking, who do the job. You know, but then it is because even our educational system is failing. If you say it's compulsory for a child to attend junior secondary school, you know, before, I mean, he does anything. That means that he must be at school, she must be at school. But these children, you know, they are not at school. And, I mean, their parents cannot afford whatever we call the school fees or the cost of taking them to school. And so they allow them to, to do all these things. So I'm thinking that government must come up with very strong, I mean, uh, uh, legislation. That in, the minimum is that there must be an agreement. The minimum is that parents must be held responsible. You know, to say, okay, if your child is less than so and so years, don't give this child out. This child must stay with you. Child must be at school, and this must be enforced. If it's yeah. not enforced, should we, should we perhaps have maybe some special unit or some special, uh, yes, unit uh, that will be solely responsible for issues related to this domestic violence and uh, at the police, for instance? Okay, I think there should be. I've, I've not read um, the Child Rights Act, you know, but the, the child the, that act is supposed to take care of some of some of these uh, issues because. This thing is recurring. You know, this domestic violence is recurring. I'm thinking that we have enough laws to tackle these things. It is simply because of corruption. You know, and that is why I'm thinking that we must hold the police responsible. Because even when these cases so, are reported so, to the police, they do very little. All right, so like the case in Oregon State, I'd like for us to, 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 you know, to speak to that. At what point do we say, oh, uh, this is a, a, an issue. This is a private matter between a couple. Mm. Uh, at what point do we then say also that this has gone beyond, you know, normal, and mm. there is need for a third party to come into it? Mm. A third party, whether it's police or parent, and all of that. Because, like in the case of the Oregon State woman, uh, the woman was said to have built a school, 
mm. where she registered to school in the name in her name and in the name of her husband but there seemed to be a battle in the sense that the fa the man wanted total control of the ha the, the, the the school you mm. know the school that the very school that she built you know and all that but because she refused uh, she was constantly being abused mm. uh, till this very day where he used a padlock from the story mm. uh, and hit her on the head and she probably she did a voice note uh, to report the issue but by the time she was taken to the hospital you know she gave up and, mm. and all that so how do we get third parties involved even though it's a marital affair well i um, i think one of the issues that we need to one of the things i would suggest is that you know, our religious organizations need to do more to enlighten people on the issue of submission. You know, if you go to, if you go to church, you are, the woman is to submit to your husband. She's your husband. Everything you have belongs to him. You understand? And with that kind of um, uh, doctrine or teaching, you know, even if the woman uh, has, I mean, has a whatsoever a business or if the woman's wealth. She will you not know, even feel that it is hers. She feels that it is her husband's, you know, that kind of thing. And it is for that reason that a man can just decide to appropriate, you know, I mean, Mr. his wife's Abba, institution. Is this really about submission? Of course. That, that, is, that is the kind is of Is that why a man of, will hit his wife with padlock on the head? No, because that's, she failed that's to is, submit. You know, what I'm trying to build is this. You know, the, the kind of society that we are, you know, does not. Um, Propagate the idea of a woman, you know, you know, standing on her feet, like a woman must be seen to be dependent on a man, or whatever she has belongs to the man, you know. So this is not, uh, it, this is not the right, it's not the right thing. So I'm thinking that from the cultural background, must must deal with the situation. Now this woman has the right to dignity, human dignity, and she, there is no reason why her husband should, you know. Uh, lock her. I think she locked her in the house, you know, and use hammer on her and be brutalized. Her. It's totally wrong. You know, it is a violation of her right as a as a human being. But what I'm driving at is that the, our society tends to, you know, uh, put the woman in the second place. Tell the woman, look, you are dependent on the man. You are subject to the man. You must be, you must submit to the man. You know, and because of that, you see, you see men over stretching that. Uh, let me use, use, use the word that doctrine to do whatsoever is I mean is wrong to their to their wives and this this must not be accepted and I'm thinking that security agencies must intervene. All right. I'm All thinking right. that this woman uh, must go to court. You know, you know what I've observed is that for some of these cases that we have had, you'd find that the very incident that will lead to the death of the the person, the woman, mm. is not the first. It has been happening yes. in in most cases. Mm. It's been happening, but somehow uh, maybe the women maybe think that this is I can manage this. Or even you know, when they and, go to their keep, to their family member, they say, "You know, it's your it's your husband. Just go back, go and manage know, your life." Exactly. So, <clears throat> how do we get people to understand that? Look, when your life is threatened, it's time to move away. It's time to move out. Mm. It's not for you to say, "Oh." Uh, you, for you to sit and hope that the situation will change or the man will change. Mm. Uh, sometimes the men can be very corny. They will come by and say, oh, uh, it was a mistake. Uh, the, no, promise, the right thing is that if, if you know your, li your life you is in danger, you better, you better separate. You know, uh, many churches preach separation, not divorce. They will say, look, separate. You know, go and stay on your own for some you time. Know, you know, Dr. You Abba, know? some persons have said that Yes, in Nigeria, we tend to use the religious homes and all of that. Mm. But some people have said that it would be better if we had trained persons to actually counsel uh, couples if there's a problem. You know, there are actually people who are trained in this area who know, okay, what to say. Because the religious houses sometimes, uh, they will give their own perspective as much as they know. But the idea of visiting going for therapy in Nigeria. It's not something mm. people Well, it's, have it's something embraced. that has not, I mean, that, that, that is not um, accessible, I mean, as it should be. You know, you don't have institutions like that that anyone can quickly run to, except you have some NGOs I mean, who, who tend to 
to assist in that manner. But you know, the reason why I, I, I let me use the word I attack religious institutions is because they are the ones that people readily go to. Say, look, this is the problem I have with my husband. And the pastor will say, look, what God has joined together, let no man put us on that. Go and solve this thing now. You go to your family member, they will say the same thing. But then there's need for us, you know, to come up with, I don't, I don't want to say laws, you know, right. but institutions but, but, that right, are there. I, before he goes, I want him to talk about the AKT situation. <laughs> and we don't have a lot of time. Right. AKT, two speakers in one week. What do you say <laughs> to that? I mean, the meeting yesterday started at 6.30 a.m. Mm. And right now, there are reports that there's tension in the state. Mm. I mean, it's... Do they have to meet at 6.30 a.m. to, to, to well, elect a new speaker? You know, even, even um, the security agencies gave them cover. You know, because as early as, I mean, before that 6 a.m., the security, the place was already cordoned off, and the security agencies were were there. But this is a democracy, you know. You see, in a democracy, things must be transparent. Things must be done in an open manner. You know, things must follow the rules. So I don't see any reason why you should meet at 6 a.m. to to dethrone, you know, a speaker and install another and all this and all that. It is it is it is quite unfortunate that we are having that at this mo at this moment. That's not what you should be experiencing in a Kitty State. Definitely not. All right. And All right. and the the the, outgo, the one that was removed yesterday, he alleged that there was a meeting call where the former governor actually mm. uh, told them his preferred candidate. Mm. Why are we still having that? I mean, shouldn't it be put into a vote and then somebody emerges? Mm. That is the problem we have with the with, with the with the with the, with the country's uh, uh, legislature. It's either at the at the level of state, you know, state house of assembly. You know, they, you always have the governor dictating who becomes what, who gets what. You know, I even mean, some of them did not get there, except that the gov a particular governor, you know, say, look, you are the one that comes from the solo government to be here. They dictate everybody who gets there, and that is why the House of Assemblies are now in a kind of rubber stamp. They don't challenge the governor, they don't challenge the executive. Whatever the governor says or the executive says, that is what they do, and that is not good for our democracy. All right. Mm. Well, unfortunately, we have to go. Uh, I wanted to say, well, w that's also a very important factor to the issue of the gender-based violence and domestic violence, which is the economic factor. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons why some women decide to remain, even despite all the abuses. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes they feel if they leave, where do they go to? Mm -hmm. What do they do? You know, how would they survive and all that? But I guess we should have organizations. Uh, uh, that are working on that. It's, uh, we should have many of them all over the country, you know, beyond religious organizations. Yes, and people know, should and know that. People should know them. Because as long as we depend on the counsel from these organizations, these things will continue. People should know their rights. Yeah. You know, even, if, even if you don't have you know, food to eat, you must not die because uh, you, don't, you, cannot, so you, cannot, you cannot feed yourself. All right. you know. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Teoflos Abba. He is the director of Daily Trust Foundation, giving us perspectives on some of the stories on the front pages this morning. We have to go because of time. Mm -hmm. We'll take a short breather, and then when we return, top of the hour, we'll take a look at the headlines again. Join us again. Well, the situation where you find that they look like the Not necessarily 